Mr. Yitzhak Herzog, Chairman of the Jewish Agency. I want to thank the Ronsar spokesman of Mr. Herzog and Adas Tesher, spokesperson for the foreign press, and my colleagues at JPC for facilitating this webinar. Yitzhak Herzog served in several ministerial positions and in 2013 was elected as chairman of the Labour Party. No, no, 2013, 2015, I was candidate for prime minister. Right, and as a head of the Zionist Union, I uh, won 24 seats in the 2015 elections, making it the largest opposition faction. And in 2018, he was elected chairman of the Jewish Agency. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Herzog, and please share with us your uh, thoughts about the plight of the Jewish communities during uh, coronavirus. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I want to wish each and every one of you well in this scented uh, era. And I want to thank you, Uri, for initiating this uh, platform. Look, I, I chair the Jewish Agency for Israel, which is the world's biggest Jewish organization. <clears throat> this organization was founded well over 90 years ago to bring about the creation of the national homeland of the Jewish people. And after the formation of uh, the State of Israel was commissioned to bring uh, all the new Im immigrants, the Olim Chadashim to Israel, we brought almost 4 million Olim to date. This year only 35,000 from 45 countries. And uh, in the last generation, our main focus is, of course, attending to the needs of the entire global Jewish collective, to the communities, to connecting them to Israel, Jewish continuity, Jewish identity, and experience affected uh, by this uh, crisis uh, as we attend to the needs of so many. So I'll just touch upon some of our main challenges. Um, first and foremost, the needs of Jewish communities. There are small Jewish communities, especially all Jewish communities are at, at risk and impact. And Jewish communities usually are big. Built with institutions that keep the community going are the houses of worship, the Jewish center, community center, that's always very important. That's where people meet and gather and hold the events and festivities and ceremonies. Schools, kindergartens, and social services, attending to the, uh, to the needy, the old age, the Holocaust survivors, and so forth. In most communities, all of these have been put on hold or paralyzed or kept frozen. And that's right, that's where we enter because we care for the well-being and needy Jewish communities. Uh, for example, we were the first ones, together with Karen Isod, to extend a an immediately immediate urgency assistance to the Jewish community of Italy, both Rome and Milan, who have been impacted dramatically as well as all the smaller Jewish communities. There are about 20 other small Jewish communities in Italy. We have seen the pressure surmounting on communities in Spain, in France, in Britain, in North America, Latin America, naturally, it's a, in South Africa, huge pressure on communities, which are mostly based on philanthropy and membership of, and activities. There are many questions still pending in the air. For example, summer camps. Jewish summer camps are very important uh, pillar of Jewish community activities. Um, it's not yet clear what will be the policy on summer camps. It's being discussed and deliberated upon and will be decided upon in May. Yeah, but put it on hold, on mute. Okay, now, um, the second issue that came about, of course, is um, the plight of the Israeli non-for-profit sector. We, the Jewish Agency, have always, on behalf of the entire global Jewish world, we, by law and covenant, represent the Jewish world in Israel. And as such, 
And together with Jewish World, we've impacted Israeli social services, nonprofit sectors, NGOs, Amutot, for decades. Now we find that they are all impacted dramatically. And I took the lead and the initiative to lead the round table of all of the nonprofit organizations to find ways and means to help them. And this is in this era, we are negotiating with the government a package of assistance, but a par a parallel to that with the Jewish agency, we've launched a loan fund, an emergency loan fund to uh, NGOs. We are together with Ogen, which is a major social loan uh, bank or Amuta who serves social purposes. And uh, we already helped uh, quite a few. But again, I voice and I raise the voice of the third sector, the civil sector in Israel, which counts for 15% of our GDP and 16% of our workforce. Thirdly, there's always a civil, civ silver, I mean, thirdly, we, we own the biggest social housing company in Israel called Amigur. And Amigur has the biggest Num number of old age tenants. We have 7,000 old age Olim and Holocaust survivors, mostly underprivileged, with lack of capital or income. Um, you know well how everybody is putting, you know, the old age under curfew, under limitations. Uh, we are working 24-7 to maintain their well-being and cheer them up and also try to help them for Pesach. We just completed a major, major effort to supply matzot to communities all over the world. We completed it. We're just coming out with an announcement. Leon will pass it on to you. And we supplied in very difficult circumstances to communities all over the world. We just had a, a huge amount, half a ton of matzot to Ethiopian, to Ethiopia, to our communities in Gondar and Addis Abeba. And we also helped them with their emergency needs. And then there's always a silver line in every cloud. We had a, a nonetheless Aliyah migration to Israel has continued with no limitation except limitations that were imposed by the situation by the Ministry of Health. So by that, together with the Ministry of Absorption in Israel, we have come to terms with the Ministry of Health. We had 1,000 immigrants this month from over 15 countries. It's an amazing experience to bring people to immediately in quarantine. Today, a large group of our immigrants will finish their quarantine and we'll be able also to ce celebrate Pesach with the lockdown of the Israeli government, something which I told them they will always remember and look back and smile and say we were there. So all in all, I think it's a challenging era for the Jewish people. It is clear to us that there will be also repercussions. We are looking in cautious, caution about anti-Semitism and, uh, and uh, of course, assisting community with our security assistance funds, assisting the communities. Uh, we will uh, review closely with our partners the issue of uh, um, experiences. As you know, Israeli experiences are a very major tool in Jewish identity. Naturally, Masai and birthright were all postponed there are many communities, all partners of ours, and we're involved in them. And so there, the, the challenge is ever, ever interesting 24 seven. We are aware of course that philanthropy, which is our basis will also be impacted. And uh, we will be discussing it with our partners abroad, which are the Jewish federations of North America. And can I thought both have helped us tremendously in the emergency needs that have been supplied to communities. Thank you very much for enabling me to speak to you. And I open the floor for questions. So, Each one say your name and where you're from. So, thank you, Uri, again. Uh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> uh, 
everybody is on mute, so I, uh, when they type the question, I read it to you. Uh, so the first question is, uh, uh, how bad you got, are you going to be impacted by the fact that uh, donations from, from abroad, mainly from America, uh, is going to be hampered because uh, communities will look more inward before uh, uh, shifting funds to, uh, to Israel? I think it's uh, too early to judge. We have a very strong board. We, which comprises, of course, of the World Zionist Organization, the Jewish Federations of North America, and the Karen I saw. They're all uh, discussing and deliberating. All communities are in it right now. We depends a lot on... Uh, what will be the... Really, 2020 will be a special year, but we don't yet know, and we can't assess. For example, we've seen some extremely beautiful actions taken by foundations and philanthropists uh, in helping the other. We also know that communities will look inwards, on, on especially on their social services, but it's too early to judge. Uh, there's a, a question from Baba Diamond. Uh, what, what will be the impact on the Shlichim program, the emissaries. So uh, uh, it's a very United good States, question. Ilel on campuses and others. Very good question. So I can say the following. Our emissaries on are working 24 seven on site. And in many instances have become a pillar in the community in helping uh, meeting the challenge of social services for supplying food for the needy, uh, opening a hotline for services of the community and helping the community. They are the best of Israel and we are very proud of them. And so if campuses are closed, they're helping in other issues. By the way, also doing a lot of activities on Zoom, on the web, initiating classes and courses and working uh, really tirelessly. We did call back our Shinshinim, hundreds of them, who are 18 year old gap year kids back to their homes because they in the services that they live with families and it became kind of a complication uh, in some instances and we decided it'll be better to bring them back to Israel to uh, for an extended Pesach vacation we will review the situation with our partners and the federations and the communities after Pesach question from Josh Aronson can you expand on the can Josh, I which paper the are you which paper is Josh? Which media outlet? Tell you in a second. Um, um, but, but in the meantime, can you expand on Ken Lysod's activities and impact? And difficulty so the, considering this year was supposed to be the 100 years of uh, that organization. I know we are very sad. We love Ken Lysod, they are our partners. Let me just explain to those who don't understand the politics of the Jewish uh, institutions. So Theodor Herzl, the founder of modern day Zionism, founded the World Zionist Organization. <coughs> the World Zionist Organization established JNF, what's called Karen Kayem, a Jewish national fund to redeem the land of the Holy Land and the Karen I sought to fundraise and raise funds to redeem the land. Uh, both these ent entities celebrate over a hundred. And when Balfour came forward with the Balfour the Declaration, it was decided to establish a Jewish agency that will work towards uh, the uh, implementation. And we are the Jewish agency. Uh, after many, many evolutionary steps, both uh, uh, Ken, the Ken Kayemet became much more independent. Ken I saw uh, Jewish federations of North America are the ones in charge of the operations in North America, what used to be UJA. And uh, Ken I saw this in all countries outside the, the United States. And the Ken I saw has been working on many activities which are very important to us but it is uh, of course uh, challenging we've been speaking to leaders of communities all over the world and they're all the same they're all in their homes they're all in zoom 
their activities are all on hold and uh, we are all uh, giving them a big hug. The Jewish heart will pulse together when we read the Agada tomorrow night. Okay, Hannah Berry is from BBC, Spanish and uh, Latin American um, uh, press. Um, um, she's also the editor of Jewish uh, Weekly in Uruguay. Uh, she spoke with you a few months ago when you visited Montevideo. Uh, mm -hmm. Any special remarks? Well. Yeah, any special remarks you can share with us regarding the Latin American Jewish communities? The Latin American Jewish communities are a challenge because of a lot of, uh, you know, pressures on the Argentinian community due to the economic crisis in Argentina. As for the corona, you know, Uruguay is a well-managed country and the corona uh, situation in Latin America is relatively under control. We do not have any reports of, of major, major, um, major challenges that are any extraordinary, uh, that are extraordinary to any other community. I can say though, that we did notice in the last year a rise of anti-Semitism in Argentina and uh, there were some very troubling events. It's not connected to Corona, but I said before, right now, everybody's in their homes. We sincerely hope there won't be a rising wave or tide after the uh, Corona uh, crisis will start fading away. I, a question from me. Uh, Anti-Semitism is an ongoing problem, but do you think coronavirus will have a certain uh, special impact on this? For example, there's conspiracy theories about the Jews. Uh, so the I, I want to make clear that right now, you know, uh, this is just for background purposes, okay, for everybody, and not for quote. In relative terms, <laughs> The rhetoric, the hate rhetoric in some areas in, uh, of the world is aimed at Chinese. Uh, the Jews are only second or third or fourth place. Now again, this is off record, so we agree on the rules. Uh, uh, but I wanna explain the situation to you further so that you follow up on it. Take for example, the British Jewish community. 5% of the casualties, those who are dead in England are Jews because of many circumstances like celebrations, pouring parties, you know, Jewish life in communities is always full of events. Every night there's an event in every congregation. So it's disproportional and people started hinting here and there also in, Amer in New York. It was said to the president as well by somebody in, in the Zoom talk he had, that there is a lot of anti-Semitic undertones in the rhetoric in, on what's going on in, in New York, Brooklyn. And we assume it will, we, we saw a David Duke post. So we are, we're sure it's gonna come up somehow, but right now, because of everybody's at home, et cetera, and other needs and of human beings, it's not the top of the list. There's a Go question ahead. from uh, Ari Bussel. Israel Week, Israeli press in Los Angeles, he's online, uh, uh, which also asks about the uh, uh, anti-Semitism that Israel is uh, released, has released the virus. Israel is profiting uh, to it. Israel has already had the solution. Um, so what are you planning to do uh, to really to meet or to uh, fight this kind of next wave of anti-Semitism? Look, I would be care careful here. <clears throat> we know of a few cases like that. We don't know if it's gonna be there or not. And uh, everybody's on alert on that, but I'm not sure. We saw some people blaming conspiracy theories. Believe me, there's so much conspiracy theories going all over the world on many nations. I say right now, we are just monitoring it with other agencies. You mentioned the, the Haredi or the other Orthodox in New York. Um, it brings back memories of the measles 
measles uh, disease, you know, when they refuse to take vaccines. Uh, we are now, as we speak about uh, containing the, the plague in Israel, the Haredi are singled out for uh, uh, not conforming to the regulation. You think? Yeah, but that's, uh, you know, that's, I don't accept that. I think the Haredi are conforming to the rules and regulations and are behaving well like any other group in Israeli society. Everybody is attending to it, they're learning. There's a learning curve, there's an issue of passing the media, there's some minority groups. They happen to be in many situations or in humanity. I don't accept the criticism on the Haredim at all. Okay, another question from myself. Uh, do you expect a rise in Aliyah once the coronavirus is over? There may be a rise on Aliyah. It's a possibility. It needs to be analyzed in depth. We are actually reviewing it and sitting on it. Clearly, it's all linked together. Because all in all, I think, you know, Israel emerges vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Jewish communities as a, a, a country that has managed the crisis relatively well. I can say I heard very good reviews from communities all over the world who have been commending Israeli decisions and the, the health regulations. Uh, I think it all has to be done in proportion, guys. When we live here, we have our complaints and criticism, but when we look objectively on the picture on the whole, I think Israel is functionally, in functioning well, and I think society is performing well, and I think there's a sense of purpose in living here with beautiful communities, and for me to see pictures of Arabs and Jews working together to combat this horrific uh, pandemic, or to see Haredi kids delivering Shabbos meals to soldiers and, and policemen on Friday night gives me hope. Uh, you mentioned the NGOs. Uh, do, you, do you foresee a collapse of many of them? Uh, who, who are 100% uh, depending on philanthropy? Uh, because uh, I would say the following. We have introduced in the middle of operation of the um, emergency loan fund, a whole wing of mentoring NGOs, helping the management and the board reviewing the economic situation, the income projections, the activities of each and every one of the NGOs to see how they can sustain themselves. There's also a very impressive model of the Jewish Federations of North America who raised a, a major foundation of the same, with the same idea. Um, there will be NGOs who will be affected dramatically we hope that it will be as less as possible. When I was Minister of Welfare and Social Services, back in the um, 2008-2009 uh, crisis, I launched a, a special a grant emergency fund to NGOs, to Amutot, together with the Treasury, which was a huge success. We are urging the Treasury to copy it now. There was an announcement by the Prime Minister and Finance Minister to introduce a fund of 200 million shekels for emergency assistance, not loans, parallel to the loan fund of businesses, which also covers NGOs, but that hasn't picked up yet. There was a very heated debate yesterday in the Finance Committee of the Knesset as to the assistance the government is giving to the third sector. Unfortunately, right now it's not enough and it's a call of duty for the government to uh, get down to business with the third sector and help it. Uh, there's a, another question from Josh Aronson. He's from Mariv, by the way. Uh, yeah, now I saw in the end of Please. Is the agency planning on an emergency fund for, uh, helping also small businesses or only NGOs? So we have a fund for small businesses, a beautiful fund. It's called CrowdIL. You can find it on our website. 
<laughs> we <clears throat> are helping small businesses, mostly in the periphery of Israel, uh, with loans. And we had actually been assisted here. I want to express again my gratitude to uh, Jewish Federations of North America and to Karen Isod and Philanthropists, both for both funds, we've gotten their support. Uh, we are ready to wrap up. Can we take the opportunity? I saw a political question by yeah, Nose. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, what do you think about uh, the Labour Party? My, my parents are turning in the grave to see what happens to them. I right now would like to skip that because, um, look, Labour has always ha had been in a structure of mergers and acquisitions. You know, my pa, my pa, it was Mapai, before Mapai it was Poletzion. Two Poletzions merged into Mapai. Mapai then went with Rafi and Achdut Avoda, and then they became Labour and they split. So nothing is new here. I do recall very, very, very vividly the fact that I led Labour to its best result ever since Rabin's victory, 24 seats, 800,000 voters. It is very sad for me, the situation. And I, uh, and I, I, you know, I'm sorry for it, but I do feel that once there will be some proposals on the table, we will review them because the fact of going together what I called ichudim, chiburim, connections, was always the right approach in politics in Israel, in my mind. So I hope that we, they will have some chiburim that will make it uh, worthwhile in the center of the Israeli political map. Question for, for, from Hannah Beres. Can you understand or maybe even justify the decision of uh, Benny Gantz to join Bibi? So I said uh, in uh, interviews, that you know this this crisis is unprecedented this crisis is unprecedented in humanity of course everybody reminds me of the black plague okay we were not there but uh, since world war ii the world hasn't seen anything of this magnitude even before uh, people are uh, it's impacting every even every individual every family, every congregation, every community, every city, every state, every nation, and, every, and the humanity at large. So we can't ignore it. In such trying times, it is important, if possible, okay, and I say if possible with a caveat, to go together. I think that the average citizen wants to look up to who runs the nation and say, okay, they've stopped quarreling, they're going together, they're radiating a sense of self-confidence. I don't want to be torn when my business is dead and I don't know where my kid will come back from the army and so forth and so on. So the attention span of the public is not now in another elections. Contrary to that, it's actually dangerous in democracy. And I think the fact that the Knesset now is functioning is extremely, extremely important. So I can, I definitely understand Benny Gantz's step because I uh, considered heavily going into national unity myself. But it all depends, and this I say very importantly, because if you're going to quote me, quote me correctly, it all depends on the details. Okay, guys, quoting uh, correctly, uh, Mr. Herzog, thank you so much for taking the time <laughs> to be with us, and Chag Sameach to you. I want to wish all family. of you a happy Pesach, good health. My cough is only from allergy, nothing else. <laughs> and uh, uh, may we, but when we say B'Shanah Ba'ab Yerushalayim, we are in Yerushalayim, but let's have everybody in Yerushalayim with our families. Happy Pesach ve'ebriyut tova. Thank you. And uh, tomorrow, 9.45 a.m., we'll have Attila Shompalvi, political commentator <laughs> of Ynet, who will speak on the political quagmire. Thanks you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.